Energy of unprecedented power feeds the sun. It's called nuclear fusion. Could this unlimited clean energy source help us end our reliance on fossil fuels? Around the world, the race is on to harness fusion on Earth. Whoever succeeds will change the future of mankind. The energy content just in my hand right here is equivalent to what a family of four would need in electricity for a whole year. And there is little downside, no risk of Chernobyl or Fukushima. Fusion is safe. You know, like I said, meltdown runaway is not unlikely, it's physically impossible. Big dreams, but even bigger challenges. It's the holy grail of physics, and lots of people have tried and failed. Four, three, two, one, shot. In the Vancouver suburb of Burnaby, a warehouse acts as a makeshift lab. Since we started filming in 2009, this has been the headquarters of General Fusion, the unlikely startup of Quebec physicist Michel Laberge. He left a good paying job to follow his dream, to find a new source of energy to save the planet. This global warming, the situation is dire. If we don't fix that, it's not going to be good. Most fusion researchers know that the ultimate solution for energy is fusion. This fuel is abundant and cheap. Uh, so I decided, okay, I'll do fusion. Fusion is the combination of nuclei of atoms which produce a lot of energy and no carbon emissions. And unlike conventional nuclear power, no long-term radioactive waste is produced. You can find one of the fuels for fusion, deuterium, in almost unlimited quantity in water. Since the 1950s, scientists have been trying to harness fusion using plasmas, very hot gases with charged particles. Heating plasmas to hundreds of millions of degrees helps overcome the repulsive forces of the atoms, allowing them to fuse together and create a lot of energy. But easier said than done, over and over, researchers have failed. These plasmas were unstable, wouldn't stay where you put them. If they didn't stay there, they couldn't get hot. If they don't get hot, they don't make fusion. Californian physicist Kenneth Fowler is one of the pioneers of the U.S. nuclear fusion program. He began in 1957. Fusion is always accused of being 30 years away, no matter when you ask. Uh, I think we know it can work. What we don't know is you know, just how long and how hard the combined financial technical path is to get it there. Back in Burnaby, Michel Laberge believes he can succeed where others failed. When we first met him in 2009, his warehouse was almost empty, except for a large metal tube. Laberge hopes to master the energy of the future thanks to the technology of the past, the piston. Three, two, one, zero. The power plant proposed by General Fusion will have hundreds of pistons around a sphere. The sphere will be filled with rotating liquid lead so as to create a vortex in the middle. A plasma ring made up of a heavy form of hydrogen will then be injected into the middle. Once every second, all the pistons will push on the liquid lead, trapping the plasma and compressing it. The compression makes the plasma very hot and a thousand times denser. With greater heat and density, the hydrogen nuclei collide at high speed, hitting hard enough to fuse together and create energy. The cost of building the prototype would be more than $100 million a modest sum in the world of fusion, but astronomical for an ordinary physicist. We were putting a suit and a tie and going crawling on knees to go, please send money. To get there, he's had to convince investors. Put yourself in the place of any investor. There's thousands of physicists spending millions of dollars and they're not going nowhere. And this little guy that nobody knows, that have no name in the business, come to ask you for millions of dollars with this idea. As funding was running short, Laberge had a chance encounter in California that would change everything. He met Kenneth Fowler. 
being who I am and having been involved so long and occasionally in prominent positions, uh, you hear these ideas all the time, but I thought this one makes some sense. One investor hired Ken Fowler and he came at General Fusion, look at our stuff, and, and he concluded that there were no big showstopper. This thing has actually a pretty good chance of working. Fowler wrote a favorable report on the General Fusion concept, a report that would open doors. Those who have not thought about that enough look at it and, uh, you know, they don't see some wing-ding technology. God is supposed to work just by banging it with pistons. If they haven't thought about that seriously, uh, they don't appreciate what a brilliant idea that is. Then, in July 2009, the much-needed funding came together. So congratulations. I was hoping you would do some cartwheels today. I uh, will do some cartwheels in the Bank of Montreal when the check goes in. Yes. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Thank you. By Thank then, you General well, Fusion had raised $11 million to begin the work, including $2 million from the federal government. <laughs> While a small BC startup was getting ready, a large fusion project was already taking off south of the border. One of the biggest players in the global nuclear fusion race is in the San Francisco area. The Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has been conducting secret research to maintain the U.S. nuclear arsenal. It has also been exploring nuclear fusion at the National Ignition Facility known as NIF. The most powerful laser on the planet is right here. We're trying to recreate essentially a miniature star. I mean, it's, it's pretty ambitious, right, to do it with a laser, okay? And to do it, you have to get into extreme conditions of temperature and density. How does this powerful laser produce nuclear fusion? Think of a magnifying glass and of the sun. Most people have taken a magnifying glass, right? And focused sunlight onto a piece of paper. Well, with NIF, you will have just a few watts. We have a thousand times more power than all the power stations in this country. And when we focus that on the surface of this two millimeter sphere, we heat it up and voila, recipe for a star. The initial laser beam is split into two, then redirected towards two bays, each the size of a football field. There, the beams are again broken up, eventually to form 192 distinct rays. These rays repeatedly run the entire distance of the bays. With each run, boosters increase the ray's energy. The beams then converge towards the middle chamber and a small golden container. Inside, a tiny sphere which contains the fuel for fusion. May I have your attention. Main laser operation in the target bay will begin in approximately 20 minutes. All personnel are required to exit the target bay areas in the next 10 minutes. And we start to prepare the facility because we can create a very large amount of neutrons. These are potentially lethal doses of neutrons in the target base, so we really want to make sure that everyone has left the facility. Neutrons released by fusion can contaminate the target bay, but this kind of radioactivity is of short duration. Ready for system shot countdown clock. MOR ILS ready. A large team oversees the experiment from this control room. Power conditioning. Power conditioning's ready. If there is the slightest problem, the extreme conditions necessary for fusion won't be there and everything stops. So, no risk of nuclear meltdown like Chernobyl or Fukushima. Fusion is safe. You know, like I said, meltdown runaway is not unlikely. It's physically impossible. Six, it's so difficult five, to get it going. Three, two, one, shot. Under the effect of lasers, X-rays form inside the container and bombard the target. It then becomes 30 times smaller and implodes in a fraction of a second. A fusion reaction follows, releasing a lot of energy. So that is the beauty of that, that you can create this 50 micron little star in the center of the target chamber. And 
take pictures of that because it only exists for like a, a trillionth of a second long. Even that can create so much power, mega joules of energy. It's just like a little miracle that you can achieve that. Since the first tests in 2012, the team has made a lot of progress. But the ultimate goal of producing a thermal nuclear burning plasma has not yet been attained. And the fuel is not as nice and cleanly behaved when we compress it as we would hope for. And, but we have, I mean, a whole slew of issues that we are working on to improve that. The challenges are tremendous, but the rewards are all, even more tremendous, right? That you don't want to give up. A little spin on the bike. You. Back in Burnaby, the small general fusion team has no time to worry about competition. They are busy building key components of their fusion device. So, guys, can we have a couple of cable ready for tomorrow? They'll be putting the plasma injector to the test. Laberge makes one last round to check that the machine is ready. It's all go to high voltage. So if you leave a piece of metal like this on it, it'll explode. Lots of energy in there. Aha, a washer. See a washer in the work, that could be bad. Okay, is everybody ready? Hello, hello? Everybody's done? Is this ready to go? Firing now, firing. <sighs> ting, it went ting. Like anyone, one mode. And then it goes the results mode. reveal a key problem with the temperature of the plasma. It goes cold really quickly. So if the temperature drops faster than we squash it, it'll just go colder, 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 and we're not going to do any fusion. If the plasma cools off too quickly, all of La Berge's efforts will have been wasted. The team goes back to the drawing board. Meanwhile, even bigger competitors in the fusion race keep turning up. When we come back, the big daddy of fusion projects. Aix-en-Provence region in the south of France. An impressive construction site looms over the landscape. It's called ITER, the most ambitious nuclear fusion project in the world. The eyes of the planet are fixed on the crucial experiment that will take place here. This is the dawn of being able to take the sun and bring it down to, to mankind. From this point onwards, we're going to be able to be producing more energy than we put into the system. 35 countries have joined forces to build this experimental reactor. They include members of the European Union, China, India, Japan, South Korea, the United States, and even Russia. At the heart of ITER will be a large donut-shaped chamber which will contain heated plasma. So we will have here this heated gas. It'll be heated up to about 150 million degrees Celsius. We're pretty sneaky. The way that we hold this thing in place is by creating these powerful magnets. Nobel Prize-winning Soviet physicist Andrei Sakharov invented this concept, the tokamak, in the 1950s. The tokamak is a machine which traps very hot plasma using magnetic fields. The magnets will be able to create a huge magnetic field that holds this hot plasma in place, and, and then that will allow us to hold something 150 million degrees. If the plasma touches the walls of the chamber, it cools off quickly, ending the fusion. So these massive magnets are designed to trap the plasma in the middle of the chamber, preventing it from touching the sides and losing heat. Other tokamaks are already in operation, but they all require more energy to operate than they produce. It simply doesn't hold the heat long enough. What we now need is to go the next step, and, and unfortunately, the concept bigger is better, it works here. We just need to build a, big, a little bit bigger machine that holds the plasma in a little bit longer to give us a better return investment. So ITER must be built on a much larger scale than all existing tokamaks. The components are huge, including the magnets, some of the biggest ever built in the world. 
These magnets are superconductors. They produce powerful magnetic fields, but to operate, they must be kept at a temperature of minus 268 degrees Celsius. The plasma inside the chamber reaches 150 million degrees, five times hotter than the sun. So we've got uh, a, a machine of contrasts, so your incredible it, contrasts. Indeed. Uh, you bring very close, in very close proximity, the hottest point in the solar system and the coldest point in the solar system. And those two are separated by uh, one or two meters. Construction and assembly of ITER began in 2007 and will continue until 2025. It has come close to disaster because of delays and cost overruns, which have tripled. The ITER board has postponed the date of the first fusion plasma until 2035, a delay of a dozen years. Many, including the Americans, aren't pleased. I'm not going to kid you, it is very tenuous support at this point. The delays and the cost increases are causing a tremendous pressure. Lots of questions about whether it's worth it, whether we should continue. If everything goes according to plan, ITER will produce 500 megawatts of energy, just a bit more than it will use up. To be profitable, a future plant will have to be more efficient. This is the stepping stone. From here, we go to a thing called DEMO. With DEMO, that's where we're going to actually be producing energy. For every one watt in, we'll be returning at least four or five watts directly back to the grid. Back in BC, General Fusion can't match ITER's scale, but the simplicity of their concept, using old reliable pistons to compress plasma, will be the optimal solution, believes founder Michel Laberge. Okay, fire in the piston. I'm a very practical guy. I, well, when I design something, I always design it in such a way that I can build it myself. I don't want to have something too exotic and difficult to construct. The team is assembling a small-scale 14-piston model to test different components. General Fusion has managed to solve the crucial problem of the plasma cooling off too quickly. But a key question remains. Will the plasma be stable enough to produce fusion when it's compressed? Short of building an expensive full-scale prototype, the team needs another way to test its concept. At a test site nearby, a small plasma injector is installed inside this container. Instead of pistons, the plasma will be compressed using explosives, which have similar properties. The biggest risk to general fusion is whether or not the physics of our scheme is going to work. When we looked at the energies and the velocities that are needed to do our physics, it's very similar to the energies and velocities that you find with high explosives. Next day, the explosives are placed inside a ring at the top of the container. Get everybody off the top of the container, please. As a precaution, we take refuge inside another container. Magnetics. Charging. The moment of truth, the team has only one chance to succeed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was good. <laughs> Nice, did it. Well done, guys, well done. The team is anxious to see if the measuring equipment and the plasma injector survive the blast. Oh. All of this is pretty much intact. But on the whole, this is looking fantastic. The last couple of times, we actually blew the door off. So just a review of the diagnostic head, we had more or less... At first, the, the results seemed disappointing. The compressed plasma was too unstable to generate fusion. But recent field tests suggest General Fusion may have overcome that challenge too. The Canadian startup is now raising funds to build its first large size prototype, hoping to reach the holy grail of energy in the near future. I'm quite convinced that Fusion will run this planet one of those days. Now, when is this one of those days? That is a little bit more difficult to answer. Here at General Fusion, we would like to think about 10 years. The race towards nuclear fusion has turned into a marathon, and the finish line is constantly moving. But many researchers believe we are now on the cusp of a breakthrough that will change the world and help us save our planet.
for The National. I'm Frederik Zalak in Vancouver. <laughs>